Hi everyone, I'm Amanda. I'm an instructor at the DNA Learning Center and today I'm going to give you a virtual tour of one small section of the Our Human Inheritance exhibit here at the DNA Learning Center in Cold Spring Harbor. I'm standing in front of one of the center pieces of our exhibit, which is a replica of the very first model of DNA that was built in 1953 by James Watson and Francis Crick. This replica was actually built for us by some experts from the London Museum of Science. But what's really, really cool about it is that you can get up close and personal with it and see what it's actually made of. So when Watson and Crick were studying the structure of DNA in the 1950s, uh, they were in a race with labs all over the world to solve the structure. They used information from other labs, and we'll talk about some of that information, but let's look at the model first. The only difference between this model and the real model is that this one is a bit taller, I think about two feet taller than the original. And the big metal pole in the center of this model is actually a giant ring stand, which is a piece of chemistry equipment. Normally you'd see a ring stand with test tubes or glassware attached to it, and to attach glassware to the ring stand, you would use clamps. So you'll see in the middle, attached to the ring stand on this model, there are clamps. So Watson and Crick used equipment that they had in their laboratory at the time. Around the outside of the model, you'll see these smaller, thinner pieces of wire uh, coiling around the outside structure. Those were from a, a chemical molecular model kit that they had in their lab. The only piece that was made from scratch that they had to make homemade were the flat pieces in the center. Now, if you know anything about the structure of DNA, you probably know, number one, what we call this structure or shape. Any guesses? If you said double helix, you're right on. So Watson and Crick discovered that DNA structure was a double helix. What does that mean? Double means two, and a helix is actually a spiral. So this structure is two spirals twisting around one another. And if you look closely, you should be able to see around the outer edge that molecular model bit builds the helical structure. And there are two of them twisting around one another. You might also know that inside the double helix, there's a code. It's called the genetic code. And the genetic code is comprised of four chemical units called nitrogenous bases. And you might know their names. There's A, adenine, T, thymine, G, guanine, and C, cytosine. Those flat pieces in the center of the model are those nitrogenous bases. Some of them are even labeled with their letters. And they're held together by small pieces of wire representing hydrogen bonds. It's a beautiful molecule. And you may have even seen things in your daily life or pieces of art or even things that you can buy that have this shape. For example, I've seen wind socks in the shape of a double helix. It's become somewhat iconic. Earrings. And it even reminds me of those barbershop poles with the red stripe that moves. Absolutely beautiful. Is real DNA this big? Absolutely not. It's much smaller. But model building is a super important skill for scientists who are studying very, very small molecules. How else would Watson and Crick have showed the world what they believed the structure to be? without building a macroscopic model, something we could see with our eyes. Now, I'm often asked, how did they figure this out? I'm going to tell you about one of the very important pieces of evidence that was used, and it came from another laboratory that was using a technique called X-ray crystallography. If you come around this way, there's a panel on this exhibit all about another scientist named Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin's picture is down here on this panel. And she was a graduate student in the lab of Maurice Wilkins. She was taking beautiful X-ray photographs of molecules, including DNA, using this technique called X-ray crystallography. And there's actually a photograph here that was taken by Rosalind Franklin of the DNA double helix. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see this picture, this looks nothing like DNA. But if you see that X-shaped pattern in the middle, 
these are actually the crisscross pattern of the base pairs all along the inside of the double helix, which is actually a cylinder when it's held on its side. So if you have a molecule like DNA and you purify it, you can shoot x-rays at the molecule. The x-rays bounce off and they make what's called a diffraction pattern. That diffraction pattern from Rosalind Franklin's photograph was the final piece of the puzzle for Watson and Crick and solidified their theory that DNA was indeed a double helix. Unfortunately, when the Nobel Prize was awarded in the 1960s, Rosalind Franklin was not the third recipient. It was her boss, Maurice Wilkins, who received the prize along with Watson and Crick. Uh, does anyone know why? Well, it turns out that the Nobel Committee has a rule. You have to be living to receive a Nobel Prize. And unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin had passed away before the time the prize was awarded. But her contribution to the discovery of the double helix is something very important. And it's an important part of the story that I'm telling you today. So thank you, Rosalind Franklin. We're going to move now to another part of the exhibit that explores what DNA looks like inside cells. Let's take a look at the wall behind me. So you'll see on the wall, there are strands of DNA with that nifty double helix shape. And they get condensed. They start folding very tightly. And then they wrap around those little circular balls. Those are actually special proteins. And they wrap and 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 wrap and, wrap and eventually form this structure called you got it, it's called a chromosome. At certain times inside our cells, the DNA looks like this, a big jumble of stringy DNA. But when a cell is getting ready to divide, the DNA gets all folded up very carefully to form these chromosomes. And I actually have a really neat picture of some real chromosomes on this touch screen here that says our genome. So these little puffy things that look like marshmallows are actually chromosomes. And the photograph of these chromosomes was taken with a scanning electron microscope. So they're magnified hundreds of thousands of times. I just love the way that they look. What's really cool about chromosomes is the DNA is highly organized inside the chromosomes. Uh, you would imagine uh, taking a piece of string and very carefully coiling it. Well, it turns out in our chromosomes, our DNA is pretty much coiled the same way in each one of us. And when all the DNA gets coiled up into chromosomes, we expect to see a certain number of chromosomes inside each of our cells. Now, this only counts for cells that are not used for reproduction. So skin cells, muscle cells, bone cells. This is the number of chromosomes that I would expect to see when all the DNA is folded up. If you had a chance to count, there are actually 23 pairs of chromosomes and then one extra little chromosome here labeled MT. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if I put all these chromosomes together, all of this coiled up DNA, I have what's called a genome. And genome sounds like another word you've probably heard before, gene. Well, a genome is a collection of all the DNA that makes up all the genes that make up you. So genes are pieces of DNA that carry information that ultimately will play a role in your traits, things about the way you look, things about the way your body functions. In the human genome, the 23 pairs of chromosomes plus that one extra down there labeled MT, I would find the thousands of genes that it takes to make a human. And believe it or not, a lot of those genes are the same no matter who I look at. But there are sometimes variations in some of those genes that determine interesting traits. So on this touch screen, what I can do is click on, let's say, a pair, pair number two. And don't forget, in a pair, one of those chromosome number twos is from a mother, and the other one is from a father. But they're duplicates. I'll find the same set of genes in chromosome two from mom as I do from chromosome two from dad. But those genes might be different versions called alleles. I'm going to tap on one of these little rings. So these represent genes located in this specific chromosome, number two. So let me try this one. Oh, that might look familiar. This is a picture of Utsi the Iceman, who we have a replica of in another part of our exhibit. And it looks like there's a gene on chromosome number two called LCT. And it's a gene for a protein called lactase. 
That's an enzyme that can break down lactose, a dairy sugar. This is an interesting gene because it plays a role in whether or not people are lactose intolerant. Utsi was lactose intolerant. That's why we have Utsi here. It turns out that over 60% of all humans are lactose intolerant, and it has to do with a variation associated with the production of this protein, lactase. So the lactase gene is found in chromosome number two. I'm going to go back to home and pick another one. Let's look at chromosome five. All right, I'm gonna pick this red. Ooh, here's another gene. So on chromosome number five, it looks like there's a gene called egg flam. I may not be saying that correctly. This is the name of the protein that it codes for. I'm not going to read that, but I'll tell you what it does. This gene has the recipe to make a protein called picaturin. I picked this one because it just makes me laugh. Picaturin sounds a lot like the Pokemon Pikachu, one of my favorites. It turns out Picaturin is a protein that's made in the photoreceptors of our eyes. And lightning fast, it allows the eyes to transmit signals from photoreceptor cells in the eyes to the brain. It helps us see, and it acts very, very quickly, which is why it has that nickname, Picaturin. Pretty cute. I'm gonna go back. Let's look at another one. Chromosome number nine, pretty cute. Ah, one of my favorites. So on chromosome nine is a gene called ABO. ABO is a gene that determines blood type. And you might be familiar with the blood types, so you can be A, B, A, B, O. Variations in this gene will determine what your blood type actually is. And I'm often asked, why do we have different blood types? Does it matter? Essentially it doesn't, but it turns out that there might be a historical reason why we have different blood types, and it has to do with infectious disease. Uh, one example is a disease called cholera, which is caused by bacteria that can live in contaminated water. It turns out if you're type O, like me, you're more susceptible to infections from the bacteria that cause cholera. But if you're AB, you're less susceptible. You're less likely to get that infectious disease from contaminated water if you're drinking it. So maybe certain blood types were selected for in different groups of people depending on where they lived and their exposure to different types of germs like bacteria. A very interesting story. So in addition to fun genes like this that determine traits that we're kind of familiar with, there are some genes in our genome that actually tell us about our history. So our genomes aren't just the cookbooks or the instructions to make us today. They're the instructions that we've inherited from all of our ancestors before us. So within the genome, tucked away, there are genes like this one, BNC2, which is also located on chromosome 9. And by the way, in a chromosome there can be thousands of genes. We're just looking at a few. BNC2 is actually a gene that we inherited from our relatives, the Neanderthals. Humans and Neanderthals, tens of thousands of years ago, lived together in parts of Asia. And believe it or not, this is evidence that humans and Neanderthals were commingling. They were interbreeding. In the human genome today, there are a number of genes like this one that we carry in our genomes today from these crossbreeding events that happened a long time ago. It's like our relic. And this one has to do with tanning. So it turns out 70% of Europeans have a version of this gene, a Neanderthal version, that causes uh, increased incidence of sunburn. Hmm. And this probably has to do with where the Neanderthals were living and where humans were living, uh, further away from the equator. It turns out when you're further away from the equator, you're not exposed to the sun as much, and exposure to the sun is important because it helps us make vitamin D. We need it. So as our ancestors moved away from the equator, out of Africa and up into Europe, it was an advantage to have a version of this gene, to have less pigment in our skin so that we could absorb more ultraviolet light and produce more vitamin D. Pretty interesting story. So I'm going to go back and hit the last set of chromosomes. You might have noticed all the pairs have numbers. This last pair is labeled with letters. So there's an X chromosome and a Y chromosome here. I just tapped Y on X and then I'm going to go back and start with X. All humans have an X chromosome, at least one. The X chromosome is important. It's got a lot of essential genes. Some of the genes that we highlighted here have to do with interesting things like color blindness. 
So there are genes on chromosome X that allow our cells to make opsin proteins, and those are proteins that allow us to see different wavelengths of light and hence different colors. Mutations in these genes lead to red-green color blindness. Here's another one. F8 and F9 are genes to make blood clotting factors. Uh, so when you get a cut and you start bleeding, usually it takes a pretty short time to start clotting, and it's because of a cascade of these special proteins being produced after an injury. Mutations in these genes cause a condition called hemophilia, uh, and when you're hemophiliac, it takes longer for your blood to clot, which can be very dangerous if you have a serious injury. But hemophilia caused by mutations on these genes in chromosome X is called sex-linked, a sex-linked disorder. And it turns out that color blindness also is sex-linked. And why is that? Well, it has to do with the fact that if you're a male, a biological male, you only have one of these X chromosomes. And its partner is a chromosome called the Y. Only biological males have a Y chromosome paired with that X. Females actually have two X's. So let's think about that. If I'm a female and I have two X's, one with a mutation for color blindness and one not, will I be color blind? Nope. So I have that healthy gene. I'll be able to see all colors, but I'm what we call a carrier, meaning I can pass that mutation onto my children. If I'm a male and I just have one X, and then a little Y. I'll use my pinky for the Y. <laughs> if there's a mutation for color blindness in that X chromosome, will I be colorblind? Yep, because there's no backup. So sex-linked disorders are called sex-linked because they're caused by changes in DNA or variations in DNA on that X chromosome. And that X chromosome is part of a pair that determines biological sex. We actually have a fun game all about the heredity of the X and Y chromosomes. So if we come over here, I'll show you. This is one of the most popular interactives we have in our exhibit. And you'll see down here, we have some things that look kind of like ping pong balls. And we have a mother, and she's got two ping pong, ball, pink ping pong balls. Those represent her X chromosomes. So in her last pair, because she's female, there are going to be a pair of X's. For the father, there's an X, that's the pink one, and then a Y, that's the green ping pong ball. What I can do is I can spin this, we call it the wheel of fortune, and one chromosome from the father and one chromosome from the mother will determine if that child is biologically male or female. So let's have at it, I'll give it a little spin. <gasps> it's a girl, so it looks like an X from dad and an X from mom came together, and this child would be bi biologically female. Mm, let's try again. I'm going to spin it one more time. Oh, it's another girl, XX. What are the chances every time I spin this wheel of getting a child that's biologically male or female? To answer this, I'm going to turn the wheel upside down again. Often I'm told, oh, you're way more likely to get a female than a male when you spin this wheel because there are three pink ping pong balls here and only one green. And I can totally understand why someone would say that, but what we have to do is separate the mother's chromosomes and the father's. So for mom, she's going to donate a chromosome to the child. What will she always donate because she's female? Yep, it'll always be an X. Mom's always going to give an X. That's all she has to give. So technically, I don't even count mom when I'm figuring this problem out. It's dad that I need to look at. So the father here has an X and a Y. His child is going to inherit one or the other. Mom always gives an X, but the father can give an X or Y. So what are the chances every time I spin the wheel of getting male or female? 50-50, it's going to be one or the other. So that means every time a set of parents have a child, there's a 50% chance the child will be biologically male or female. Now, I don't know about you, but I know families, including my own, where this doesn't seem to be the rule. I have four children. They're all biologically male. X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, four times. Do you know a family like that? My mother-in-law? 
is one of 11 children. There are nine girls and two boys. Why didn't it work out 50-50? Well, every time there was a child, there was a 50-50 chance it would be male or female. It kind of reminds me of flipping a coin. So could I conceivably flip a coin and get heads four times in a row? I could. Is it likely? No, but it happens. And we see that same thing with these X and Y chromosomes in small families. But believe it or not, if you counted up everyone in the world, it works out to be very close to 50-50 biologically male and biologically female. You just need to look at a large sample set, a lot of people. Now there's one more chromosome I skipped. I'm going to come back to the screen. And that's this one labeled MT. Everyone always forgets this one, and I almost did too, but I'm going to click on it. There's an extra chromosome that a lot of people don't know about. It's not in the nucleus of the cell with those 23 pairs. It's outside in a structure called the mitochondria. That's what MT stands for. There's one chromosome in the mitochondria. And look at, it, look at its shape. It's not a big X like we were looking at before. It's a little ring, a little circular piece of DNA. And there are a bunch of genes in the mitochondrial chromosome that play a role in a process called cellular respiration, which is how cells make energy. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. So we just highlighted one of those very important genes called cytochrome, cytochrome oxidase, which is an enzyme involved in the production of a molecule called ATP, which is energy that the cell can use. The interesting thing about the mitochondria is that it's believed that at one time, billions of years ago, the mitochondria, which is now an organelle inside our cells, used to be a free living organism, an independent organism, kind of like a bacteria cell. It has its own DNA. It can reproduce using that DNA. What we think is that billions of years ago, that mitochondria became incorporated into cells and we have a symbiotic relationship with that mitochondria. It's got a nice place to live. It makes energy for us. We both benefit. Pretty cool, right? The mitochondria. So the last part of the exhibit I'd like to show you is about some of the interesting genes that cause variations. So I'm going to move to another part of the exhibit. This beautiful wall is a montage of photographs showing some interesting traits and variations of those traits that are sometimes used to show heredity or inheritance. So I see pictures of people's beautiful feet, eyes. Here's a, here's a hitchhiker's thumb, it's called. You might see how the top of it bends back. This is a whirl. Everyone's hair has a a direction, clockwise or counterclockwise. And mixed in are some beautiful photographs of things like, do you know what it is? It's a chromosome. That's another cool picture. So this part of our exhibit is all about the fact that humans share many traits. We get caught up often on differences, but it turns out, because our genes are mostly the same, we have a lot of the same traits, meaning we all have eyes and arms and legs and a stomach. We have structures that make us humans. But there are variations in some of these genes that account for the differences that we see, the differences that we always get kind of caught up on, things like skin color, height, the things that we can see most often. It turns out that a lot of the variations that we see in our traits, um, like from blue eyes to brown eyes, are determined by changes in genes. But often, it's not just a single gene. It's a whole bunch of genes. And then there are other factors also that can contribute to some of these variations, like environmental factors, things that happen outside our bodies that we can't control, either before we're born, while we're developing, or afterwards. And then additionally, there are some traits that actually have nothing to do with our genes at all. They're called acquired traits. So let's start with one of those. If we come down here, can you tell what this is? It might be hard to tell. It's a belly button. Belly buttons are funny things. You can have an innie, you can have an Audi, they can have different shapes. Is this a genetic trait? Does this have to do with any genes? Well, let's flip it up and see. It turns out 
Your belly button shape has nothing to do with your genes. You may know this already, but your belly button is a place where before you were born, there was an umbilical cord that you ate through. <laughs> when that umbilical cord fell out after you were born, it left behind a scar. And we call that scar the belly button. So that's an example of an acquired trait. Any scar that you have could be considered acquired. I've got a lovely one on my wrist from when I fell off my bike in fifth grade. <laughs> it has nothing to do with my genes. But there are some interesting genetic traits on the wall. I did mention eye color, so let me come over here. Here's a beautiful picture of an eye. Eye color is determined by a set of about 16 genes. Oh, that's freckles. I don't want to do that one. Is this one eyes? Oh, yes. <laughs> As many as 16 genes contribute to eye color. Wait a minute, let's think about that. So there are genes to make pigments in our eyes, and there are many versions of those genes, tiny little changes in the code that will affect how much of a protein, like melanin, the color in our eyes is produced. 16 genes means 16 from mom, and then another 16 from dad. So in reality, your eye color is determined by about 32 genes, alleles, all working together to make the final color that you see. When you think about it, this makes total sense. Imagine I've got blue eyes, there were 10 other people with blue eyes standing next to me. Would our blue eyes all be the same? Absolutely not. When you look closely at the iris, you'll see patterns and splashes of color. This has to do with the fact that there are so many genes all working together to ultimately determine that final color you see. One fun thing that we do with students in our exhibit when it comes to eye color is we give them a chance to use this magnifier. I think this is actually a, a tool you can use when you're putting in contacts or doing your makeup. It's a mirror really, but it magnifies too. And if you get up really close to it, I'm gonna demonstrate, really, really close to it, and look at the iris, often when you look super close, you can see colors that you didn't even know were there. And believe it or not, if you have brown eyes, it's possible there are other colors there, like blues or purples or greens. You just can't see them because there's a lot of brown. But I have had students who were pleasantly surprised to look in here and see color in their eyes they didn't even know was there. I discovered a long time ago when we installed this exhibit that I have brown dots in my blue eyes. Who knew? Pretty cool. And then there are examples of traits that maybe we don't understand as well as we used to. For example, well, here's a picture of an ear. I remember when I was in biology learning about ear shape, specifically the lobe. So the lobe of your ear is the fleshy part that attaches to the side of your head, as it does in this picture, or it flops. So there's attached and detached ear lobes. Oh, here's a picture of a detached ear lobe. So there's a nice dangly lobe there. Well, it used to be taught that this trait, whether your ear lobe was attached or not, was inherited in a Mendelian fashion, which means there's an allele or a gene for attached and an allele for detached, and you can inherit them in different patterns, and that set determines the trait. Well, it turns out, if I lift the flap, that yes, earlobes can be attached or unattached, and there are genes that probably play a role in this trait, but probably there are environmental factors also that play a role in this trait, and it's just not quite understood. Hmm. So maybe more complex than we once thought. Another one that used to commonly be used, and probably still is, to teach genetic inheritance has to do with tongue rolling. Can you roll your tongue? Mm -hmm. So it used to be believed that tongue rolling was also determined by a set of alleles, one from mom and one from dad. And there was either a tongue rolling ability or non-rolling. And together, those alleles determined the trait. Well, here's a picture of someone rolling their tongue. It turns out that there were actually studies of twins. And the cool thing about twins is that their DNA is the same for the most part. So you would expect that if one twin could roll their tongue, then the other one would also, right? It turns out these twin studies showed that there doesn't seem to be that pattern when it comes to tongue rolling. And probably it's not just genes, but it's influenced by environment in some way also.
finally, I'm going to show you fingerprints. And this is something that you can do at home. And you may have already done this. But your fingerprints, the pattern, the way your skin folds on your fingertips, is a complex trait that develops way before you're born, right when your skin is forming. And there are three kind of major shapes you can see in your fingerprints. And you probably know this, making a fingerprint would be pretty easy. You can also, if you have a magnifying glass like this one, use it to look closely at the patterns in your fingerprints. But the three major shapes are called a loop, which loops up, an arch, which is kind of like a little mountain, or a whirl, which is like a pinwheel. But if I had 10 people with loops on their thumbs, would their loops all be the same? There are always differences that allow us to tell one loop from another, variations. And it turns out that fingerprints are probably partially determined by genes. Maybe the genes very early in development play a role in that major shape you'll see, whether it's a whirl, a loop, or an arch. But environmental factors are going to dictate the uniqueness of your loop, your whirl, or your arch. Now, what could the environmental factors be before you're born? Well, a fetus lives in a watery environment, and that watery environment has molecules floating around in it that will come in contact with the skin. If the baby's skin is forming and the baby's touching the inside of mom or touching itself somewhere, these are all factors in addition to the molecules in the liquid that will make those fingerprints always unique. And an interesting fingerprint fact. So back to the twins. Identical twins have different fingerprints. They're still unique. And that's a testament to the fact that probably environmental factors play a much bigger role in that trait prop than our genes. So wait a minute. Twins grow in the same environment, don't they? Yep, they're inside mom at the same time. So what could be different about their environments? You're right. So they could be touching different things, exposed to different parts of that fluid inside mom. And as a result, unique fingerprints develop. So I hope that you enjoyed this quick tour of the Our Genome section of our exhibit. If you live close by, uh, I would invite you to come visit. When our museum exhibit opens again, we would love to have you. And please join me again for the next installment of our virtual museum tour, when I'll explore Chronicles of Change, which is all about early Earth and all the important changes that happened to facilitate life on our beautiful planet. Have a great day.